Okay, if we want to be able to measure and uh, quantify the amount of deformation that's happening in a piece of sheet metal, one of the things that we're going to need to do is to be able to measure the amount of deformation. So we'll first start out about how people measure strain when they're talking about deformed pieces of sheet metal. Now normally what you would do is you'd start off with a uh, flat piece of metal, your flat blank, and on that flat blank, if we were to scribe onto that flat blank of metal, an original size circle, right? So that circle is of a known size, known shape, and uh, that size and shape is something that we picked out ahead of time. Now when we think about that circle that we put on the material, after the deformation, that circle will deform into some sort of an ellipse. Now that ellipse, when we measure on its long axis, we would be able to measure its major strain, right? That is symbolized by the symbol um, lowercase e, followed by a subscript of MA, or uh, major, right? On the short axis of that ellipse, we'd be able to measure the minor strain. Now, in this case, we've measured uh, a major and a minor strain. Major strain is a, denoting an ellipse that is larger on its lar long axis than its original size, so we would call that a positive major strain. And in this illustration, I have the minor strain with the circle getting smaller at its waist, if you will, and therefore I would call that a negative minor strain. Now if we take the measured major strain and minor strain, and we even in this case have measured a positive major strain and a positive minor strain. Um, if we were to take that measurement and we wanted to somehow plot it, we could plot that on a graph where we have denoted a uh, horizontal axis of minor strain and a major strain being the vertical axis. Now the major strain is always going to be positive. That is because by definition major strain is always the largest axis of uh, that circle, largest axis of that circle and therefore is going to be generally increasing in size if not zero. So it's either zero or larger so that would be our major strain. Our minor strain is going to be a value lower than our major strain so it'll be something equal to or less than our major strain, it could possibly be positive, zero, or negative. So thinking about the way that we uh, want to quantify how much deformation the metal could actually undergo, we could uh, take a piece of material that we wanted to understand a little bit better, and we could on that piece of material scribe or etch a whole bunch of known size, shape, and uh, circles. And if we were to somehow, using a tool or a die, force that material to undergo uh, an amount of deformation just short of fracture, we'd be able to measure how much deformation that material was under at the time it fractured or failed. So that's exactly what happened when people started trying to quantify the forming limit diagrams. We took a uh, piece of a flat material. We took that flat piece of material, put etched circles of known size or shape on them, and then we deformed that material right up to the point of near failure. Now right at that point of near, near failure, we'd be able to now have a deformed piece of sheet metal, so maybe that deformed piece of sheet metal has some shape in it now, and it has a series of ellipses on the surface of that sheet metal, and we'd be able to measure for all those little circles any one that looks like it's too close to the point of failure, and maybe we would categorize that as a bad strain. So we measured some place on that ellipse, some value, and in this case if I had an original circle, and maybe that circle got bigger in every direction, I'd measure its major strain, its minor strain, and then I would determine that maybe this was an unhappy or bad strain value. So if this was a strain value that made me unhappy, then I could plot that on this graph, on this side of the diagram where major strain is positive, minor strain is positive, and I'd say that's a bad strain. Now someplace else on that panel, I might be able to measure a combination of major and minor strain from a circle that had not failed. So there's no failure near this other ellipse, this other possible circle, and maybe in that case I would say, well that was a good combination of major and minor strain. And maybe that's all the value that I'm getting out of this particular test. Just one or two bad strains and a whole bunch of circles that didn't fail that I would call my good strains. So what I'd have to do is I'd have to do this test again. I would have to uh, 
take another piece of sheet metal, put some more circles on it, and measure the size and shape of those circles. So maybe I have another circle, starts off original known size and shape, and it gets bigger in one direction, but stays mostly the same in the other direction. I'm trying to sketch that a little bit better. But here we go, we got it where I have a positive major strain and a minor strain equal to zero, where it has really not changed at all in the minor axis. In that case, I would find one of those ellipses that possibly failed. I would give that a bad strain denotation on my graph, and then maybe I found a bunch of other combinations of OK strain. And I could do this test over and over again for more or less the same type of material, but just using different tricks and die making in order to force the material to take on different modes of deformation. Force it to stretch a little bit more in the major direction and allow it to feed in more in the minor direction, and then I would get combinations of major and minor strain that were a bit more to this left side of the forming space, right? If I would somehow take that tool and work the tool in such a way that it stretched more in the major and in the minor direction, then I could force some forming conditions that would keep me on the right side of the forming diagram. And then, of course, if I can constrain the tool in one way that keeps more or less the strains neutral, then I'm staying more towards this center point part of the diagram. Now the trick to doing this is that if I do this test enough times for a specific piece of material, I should be able to find a relatively uh, repeatable pattern. And hopefully what I'll be able to do is do some mathematical manipulation on the data, do a little bit of data scrub, and what I could find out is a predictable line, a predictable limit between the major and the minor strain combinations that are more or less unhappy or sad strains and more or less happy the good strains. And this was the beginning of the forming limit diagram. Now uh, in the late uh, 1960s and early 1970s, we um, had many people throughout the uh, globe doing this type of data. And here in North America, most of the time, people reference Keeler and Goodwin and recognize that Keeler and Goodwin did this particular test enough times that they were able to define not only that there is a forming limit of a relatively predictable shape and size and location for mild steel, they were also able to more or less predict its location in strain space. And they found that there was a correlation between a material's end value and the material's thickness. And as they found, if the end value increases or the thickness increases, then they saw this curve shifting upwards. If they saw that the end value and the thickness were going down, then they noticed that this curve would keep more or less the same shape, but shift downward. And that was the beginning of the forming limit diagram by the definition of the forming limit curve by Keeler and Goodwin in the early 1970s. And that really does uh, make up most of the foundation of we, what we consider the beginning of formability analysis, which gives birth to finite element analysis, circle grid analysis, and thinning strain analysis. All right, well, that's it for now. I uh, do want to remind everyone that uh, you can check into uh, this channel, hopefully uh, more often, and I will put more videos up with simple explanations of forming science. Thank you.